Hey, uh, if you're like me, you know that uh, you can tell a lot about a person by the type of music they listen to. Don't tell me you haven't wondered whether or not you can actually be friends with this person once you find out what their favorite band is. In that vein, I created this app called Judge My Taste, a place where people can put in their favorite band and the internet can judge them. Basically, it's just to demonstrate an ASP.NET Core app that saves data to a SQL Server database. So I'm doing this all with Visual Studio Code um, and uh, SQL Server 2017, doing it all on a Mac. So there's a little bit of squirreliness with setting up uh, SQL Server 2017, which we'll take a look at here. Um, but other than that, enjoy. So the first thing we need to do is scaffold our ASP.NET Core 2.2 application. So I'm just going to make a directory here called Judge My Taste. Then I'm going to go ahead and change directories into that. And I'm just going to scaffold the application by doing a .NET new. If I can type MBC. And it will uh, scaffold the application and restore all the NuGet packages that go with it. Now to run it, I just need to type code and dot. And when I hit enter, this will open up Visual Studio Code and the Judge My Taste app. Okay, so the first time you open your Judge My Taste app, you might see this little thing down here in the corner that says some required assets are missing. Um, just go ahead and click yes. And what that's going to do is it's going to create this VS, .vs code folder for you. And that .vs code folder is going to have a launch.json and a tasks.json that will launch your application and launch a window um, and all that good stuff. Um, it's good for uh, easily debugging. If you've never used Visual Studio before, now you can, if you never used Visual Studio code before, you can now use VS Code and just hit your F5 like you normally would in Visual Studio proper, um, and it'll actually use those that launch and tasks to launch the application and then launch a browser window. So when we run this, we'll see we've got my, uh, this is the basic um, scaffolded app for ASP.NET MVC 2.2. Um, it's just got a privacy page and a home page and a little link to building web apps with ASP.NET Core. So next thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and scaffold the SQL Server database. Okay, now, so in the original article that I'm uh, following along here, um, the blog post that I wrote, um, I used uh, Ubuntu Linux. And <clears throat> in the screencast here, I'm using Mac OS. And there's uh, one major reason for that. And that is getting SQL Server set up on Ubuntu or on Windows is pretty straightforward. You just download it and you install it. Uh, on Mac, there isn't an actual installable version. So you need to end up using a Docker container. So that's the reason I wanted to do the screencast this way. <clears throat> so I can show you the, the Docker container and how to get that started. So um, if you don't already have Docker desktop installed, uh, go ahead and install that. It's just docker.com and uh, there's uh, products docker for desktop or I think it's called actually docker desktop and just install it there. It's pretty straightforward. Um, once you've got that installed, you should be able to do something like this docker images. Now you won't see any, um, but I've got a few of them already running here. So um, are already downloaded. Um, in this case, the one you're going to want to download is this Microsoft slash Microsoft or MS SQL Server Linux 2017 latest. And if you don't have that, which you probably won't if you just installed Docker Desktop, just do a Docker pull Microsoft slash MS SQL Server Linux with a colon and 2017 latest. Okay. And that will pull it down for you. Now, since I already have it installed here, um, once you have it pulled down, there's like nine layers to it. Go ahead and pull it down. Um, it's a fairly sizable, as you can see there, it's 1.35 gigabytes. Um, so it's fairly sizable. And depending on your internet connection, will take a few minutes. 
<clears throat> so to run an instance of this locally, you would just run a Docker run. Now you can create a Docker file for this and start it all up together if you wanted to. But uh, just for demonstration purposes here, let's just run it and we'll run it detached so that we can see, um, so that we can set a name and connect to it uh, like we might want to. Now the things that I'm going to uh, pass in here, you'll see there's an, a dash E here. That's for an environment variable. And I want to set it to uh, accept EULA to Y for SQL Server. I also need one more environment variable called MS SQL underscore SA underscore password and then set it to something uh, hopefully a little bit more secure than this. Um, and then uh, I'm going to marry port 1433 to port 1433 on localhost. This will mean that I'll be able to go to localhost port 1433 and connect it to my SQL Server, which we'll need for um, being able to create our databases and do some basic administration tasks that we're going to need. I'm going to name it uh, SQL Server 1. Uh, you can name it whatever you want to. Um, I'm going to run it in detached mode. And here's the image that I want to build this container from, which is the Microsoft MS SQL Server Linux 2017 latest that uh, we just pulled. So when I run this, it's going to spit out a big long hash. Now that's the, the hash for the container that it just started up for me. And if I do a Docker PS, I'll see this... Uh, this container that's based on the Microsoft MS SQL Server Linux 2000 latest, 2017 latest uh, image. <clears throat> and the command was actually in the Docker file that started up, just starting up SQL Server. Um, it was created 10 seconds ago. It's been up for nine seconds. And I've got localhost port 1433 forwarded from port 1433 TCP inside the container. And the name of it is SQL Server 1. Now this will allow us to connect to it and uh, do some administration like creating our database for our application and creating a user for our application to use to connect to the database. All right, so um, I've opened Azure Data Studio here and I'm gonna wanna make a connection to my database. It is Microsoft SQL Server. <clears throat> the server is actually localhost and we're going to use a SQL login, which is SA and the password that we created earlier. That super secure password that I used. Um, the database we want to connect to is default. So all of this other stuff you can leave just like it is. And we'll just go ahead and connect to it. Now we'll see we've got our master model, MSDB, TempDB, all the basic stuff that it creates. Um, what we're going to want is we want to want to click, click on master and then we're going to create a new query here. And the new query we want is to create a database. So I'm going to cut and paste some predefined code here for creating this database. So what we're going to do is we're going to use master. Then we're going to check to see if the judge my taste database exists. If it does, don't do anything. If it doesn't, go ahead and create a database called judge my taste. Now I can just go ahead and run this guy here and it'll see that it completed successfully, just took a couple thousandths of a second. Don't need to save that. The next thing we're gonna to wanna to do is we're gonna to wanna to create a, um, a table in that database. So if I come over here to my server and the database says judge my taste will be here, um, we could come in here and search for it. but it may not refresh like it's supposed to. So that's why I come over here because I can, at any time I can right click and say refresh it and then I can see my database. So I'm gonna go in here and right click, I wanna do a new query. And it's another DDL query that's gonna create our favorite bands table inside that database. So we're just going to Drop the table if it does if it already exists, and then recreate the table with an ID that's an identity seated to one, um, the name of the band, the uh, who it was entered by, and when it, the date that it was entered on. So I can go ahead and run this, and it takes just a couple of milliseconds. Then the last thing we're going to want to do 
is we're going to want to create a user for the application to use instead of connecting via SA, obviously. <clears throat> so again, we'll go ahead and right click on judge my taste. We'll set up a new query and we're going to use master. We're going to create a login called a web app with a password of this P at sign SSW zero RD with an exclamation point on it. Again, probably a little bit more secure something for your production apps. Um, the default database is going to be judge my taste for this web app login. Then we also want to enable the login and each one of these goes in between here. If you're not familiar with the uh, SQL, um, it's just going to go ahead and do that. So alter login web app enable go. Then um, it's going to say use judge my taste, which will switch us over to the judge my taste database. And then I'm going to create a user called a web app for the login web app that we just created. And then I'm going to add the role um, of DB owner. I'm going to add web app, that user that we just created here. So we created a user that links to the web app login. Then I'm going to add that web app user that I just created using the SP add role member to the DB owner of that database, since we're using judge my taste, if that makes sense. So we'll go ahead and run this. And it said, could, couldn't find stored procedure DB owner. That's because I had it highlighted because I'm a moron. So now we executed all those lines successfully in just a few seconds. <clears throat> now we'll be able to connect our application to our database. Okay, now we're cooking. So the next thing we need to do is go ahead and get our application connected to the database that we just created and allow our application to save data into that database. So a couple of steps here we need to do. First of all, I'm just going to order, uh, op open up a terminal window and I'm going to go ahead and uh, add a .NET package to this. Now you can use your NuGet package manager like you normally would. But with Visual Studio Code, especially on uh, Mac and Linux, found it's a whole lot easier to just use the .NET command line. So I've added a package here called Microsoft.EntityFrameworkCore.SQLServer. I'm uh, locking the version to 2.2.4 because I know it works. So <clears throat> we'll go ahead and add that package. Then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to jump over here to our app settings.json and we're going to add the connection string to our app settings.json for connecting to our database. So in this case, the server is a local host. Remember, we married localhost port 1433, which is where uh, SQL Server runs. We ma married that to um, our localhost port 1433. The database is just my taste. That's the one we just created. Um, the user ID is the web app, the user ID that you just created for the judge my taste um, database and the password is the one you just created for that user. Now the next thing we're going to want to do is um, you need to be able to have a model that matches that table that we just created. So let's go ahead and create a new file here and we'll call it favorite bands. Not in all caps. And this just has a couple of using statements and a property for each one of those um, items in the table. So the ID, the name, the entered by, the entered on. Now I've got data annotations already up here and it says it's unnecessary and it is unnecessary for right now, but it's going to help us out a little bit later. So <clears throat> the next thing we need to do is actually create a database context so that we can create so we can connect it to the database. So I like to, in my application, add a, a folder for that. So I'm just going to add a new folder called data at the root. And I'm going to add my context in there. So the new file is kind of going to be called just judge my taste context dot CS. <clears throat> And the uh, content of this file is just a basic database context with a DB set. So 
We're bringing in Entity Framework Core and the models that we just created. And we're going to derive from DB context, pass in whatever DB context options are passed to it when we create it. And we're going to set up a DB, uh, DB set called Favorite Bands, which matches that table name and the favorite band, which comes from the model that we just created. Okay. So now the last thing we need to do to connect our database is go into our startup and in configure services, we want to add one long line right before the MVC add MVC line. We're just going to create this line that says add a DB context called judge my taste context. We may need an import statement using statement for that. And you were going to use SQL Server, which will need an import statement for that as well. Um, if you don't know, I'm just using the command dot to get those uh, menu items to come up. Windows dot if you're on a Windows machine. Um, and then I'm going to pass some configurations to it, which this is the options that are being passed to it. Use SQL Server and then get connection string from just my taste database inside the app settings that we just set up here. So, and then the very last thing to get these two connected is we're going to want to generate a controller. Now, with regular Visual Studio, it's fairly easy. You can just say add controller and um, you get a bunch of dialog boxes. But if you're on uh, Linux or Mac and you're just using Visual Studio code, <clears throat> you can get some of that that same goodness. Um, one of the first things you're going to want to do is you're going to want to install this global tool called .NET ASP Net Generator. And here's the command to install it. It's just .NET and it's a tool and you want to install it globally and it's called .NET ASP Net Code Generator. Now I already have it installed so I don't need to run that again. Once you have it installed globally you never need to run that again. But I also do need a package for generating a controller. So the net, the other package that I'm going to need is the Visual Studio Designer. So this package is the Visual Studio Web Code Generation Design. Okay, so let's go ahead and add that package to our local project. And then we're going to run this one long command that generates our controller and all of our views for us. So Go ahead and paste this in and let's take a look at what it's doing. So <clears throat> it's calling the .NET runtime or the .NET CLI. It's saying I want to run the ASP.NET code generator. I want to create a controller. I want to name it favorite bands controller. I want to use async methods in the controller. That's just best practice. <clears throat> the model that I want you to use is the just my taste dot models dot favorite band. That's the one we just created up here in models. So this is a fully qualified with the namespace and everything. The data context is the just just my taste dot data dot just just my taste judge my taste context. Um, the namespace that I want the controller to go into is controllers, and the output directory that I want for it is controllers. This also says uh, use the default layout um, for the views and and for the for the controller. So when I run this guy, it should say it's going to building the project locally. Then it's also going to uh, start scaffolding out the generator or the controller and all the views. So you'll see that it added a view in views called create, edit, details, delete, index, and the controller that has all the actions for those. So <clears throat> let's take a look at that controller just real quick. Um, Here's our basic controller. It's going to pass in the just, judge my taste context. Um, it's going to set it. This is all generated for me by that generator. Um, it's creating async tasks. Um, it's going to pass out the views that I've got, um, as well as passing out a model for those views using await. Um, so it's using all the best practices, and it's pretty slick. Um, I really like that, that part of it. <clears throat> the other thing we're going to want to do is we're going to add um, on our main views, on our layout, 
we're going to add a menu item so that we can actually get to the favorite bands page that we the, or at least the set of favorite favorite band pages that we just created so let's go ahead and add another nav item here clean this up a little bit okay so we just added a nav link to favorite bands index called favorite bands that's not a big deal so now we should be able to run this thing and when it pulls it up in the window we should be able to see our favorite bands listing page um, in the browser So now we've got the app running, we can see this uh, favorite bands link, and when we link over to it, we can see here's our name entered by entered on, we can create a new one, and in this case the name of the band is going to be Foo Fighters, entered by me, and entered on this specific date, and this specific time. Now we've got one here. Now, as you can see, first of all, entered by people can put whatever they want in there, right? That's not ideal for us. And entering the entered on date time, we don't really want to do that. And right now, anybody can go and edit anybody else's favorite band. And really, the whole point of this is so you can judge pe people harshly by the, by the crappy bands that they listen to. So let's not do that. Let's um, let's clean this up a little bit. We'll add some authentication to it, and we'll get some things automatically entered for us to make it super easy for people to en enter their crappy bands and make it easier for us to judge them. All right. So the first thing we're going to do is because it's super easy to do, and we don't need to have any other setup to do. We're going to get the entered on date automatically entered for us. So the first thing we're going to want to do is find the create method. We're going to remove entered on that's being bound to the favorite band object when it's coming in. So we're going to move that from the model binder and we're just going to add it right above here where it says if model state is valid we'll just take favorite band dot entered on and we'll make it equal to date time dot now. The other thing we need to do is go into that um, view. So if we go into the favorite bands create view, we don't need that uh, the entered on section anymore. Okay, so now we should be able to run this thing and not have to enter the entered on date for us. We can actually have that entered uh, on our behalf based on when we actually entered it. <clears throat> so that gets rid of that cumbersome step. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to add some authentication and actually get the entered by entered for us from the authentication framework. All right, so now we want to add authentication to our application so that we can get the users who are actually entering their favorite bands without them being able to enter other people's stuff. So we're going to use Okta, obviously, because I work at Okta, and this is the Okta channel, so this is what we're going to use. Um, if you don't already have an account, you can just go right here to developer.okta.com, click on the sign up button. It's just that simple. Email, first name, last name, company name, that's it. Then you got a free account. Once you get logged in, you should see something that looks like this. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to create an application. And the first application we're going to create is the Just My Taste application. Now this is a, just a regular web app and it'll say right there .NET, Java, etc. 
Um, they also have we also have single page apps, iOS, uh, Android native apps, and machine to machine. So APIs talking to other APIs. We're just going to go ahead and choose the .NET web app here, and we're going to call it Judge My Taste. And we know it's running on port 5001. It's also running on HTTPS. So we'll need to change these two. Just the first parts of these. To go to localhost 5001. Authentication code um, is what you want to use. So that's the auth code flow for web applications. Just go ahead and click done. But one of the other things you're really going to want to do is right after you click done, it'll be taken to the you'll be taken to the general settings screen. Go ahead and click on edit again, and we're going to add a logout URI. Just click on add URI here, and you want it to be the same thing: HTTPS localhost colon five thousand one, and the endpoint's going to be called sign out callback because we're going to use the Okta SDK for .NET. And this is the route that it handles for us when the uh, application redirects back, when Okta redirects to, back to our application after sign out. So just go ahead and hit save. And down here at the bottom, you'll see a client ID, client secret. And we're going to go ahead and plug those in to our, um, we're going to go ahead and plug those into our app settings.json file. Okay, so before um, we go any further, um, let's go ahead and actually install a package here. And the package is the ASP.NETCore.NET SDK package. So it's just called Okta.ASP.NETCore. We're going to lock the version to 1.15. And let's go ahead and install that real quick. And then right below that uh, database connection that we just set up earlier, let's go ahead and set up the Okta configuration. It's pretty simple. We want our client ID, which we can pull from our client ID app settings. And our client secret, which we can also pull from our client app settings. And the Okta domain, which you'll get from your dashboard right at the top of the screen. And it'll be something like um, dev dash da 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 bunch of numbers dot octa dot com. And we'll leave this at localhost 5001, of course. So now we're all set up to use Octa for authentication but we need to let our application know how to use that. So we'll go into our startup.cs file and we're going to add a couple of usings. So the using statements we're going to need are this ASP.NET Core that we just brought in and the Microsoft ASP.NET Core authentication cookies so that it can use cookies for the authentication once it gets um, the authentication back from Okta. So at the very beginning of the configure services method, let's go and add a little section here before the cookie policy. So we're going to set some Okta MVC options, like we're going to pull the Okta setting from the configuration. We're going to set the scope to open ID, profile, and email. That means we're going to be using OpenID Connect. We're going to want the user's profile and the user's email as um, in the ID token as some of their claims. And we're also going to get those claims from the user info endpoint. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to set up some options for the authentication. One, we're going to use the regular default authentication scheme for cookies. And we're going to use the Okta defaults from the um, Okta authentication schemes. We're going to add cookies and we're going to add the Okta MVC and pass those options that we created up here. We're going to pass those into the Okta MVC. Now, the very last thing we need to do 
Now that we've configured it, we've configured that service, we need to go down here into the configuration for the app and say to use that. So use authentication means that we'll actually be using this authentication that we just added configuration for. Now we're going to go into our controllers folder and we're going to add a new controller called account controller. And the code for our account controller is pretty simple, but let's walk through it piece by piece. So we brought in our cookie authentication again, our ASP.NET Core MVC, and we brought in the Okta ASP.NET Core. So we've got our account controller, and it's based off controller, and it has a login function. That all it really does is it runs a challenge, and it pu pulls the Okta defaults, and sends it to the challenge method. The challenge just says challenge however this method says to challenge them. And for the logout, this is where it's going to end up back at is the account controller logout. And it's going to take us, it's going to def remove those default cookies and go back to Okta to log them out. So these are the two methods that we're going to use to log in and log out. Now in our views shared, we're going to create another view here, just a partial, and we'll call it our login partial. .cshtml. All right, so our login partial is just going to be a chunk that we can spit in any place we want it for the login. So <clears throat> really, I'm just going to add some extra navbar stuff here. And we've got our login and logout. They're going to use those actions that we just created on the account controller. Again, our account controller login action just runs the challenge, which is going to actually redirect us to Okta to log in and log out. Now in our shared layout, that's the last thing we really need to do is we need to make sure that we have the uh, the login partial there. So right below the favorite bands, actually there's a couple of things we need to do to this. So in here, one of the things we're gonna wanna do here is this navbar collapse right here. We're gonna wanna change that out just a little bit so that we can push the login menu to the right hand side and keep everything else on the left hand side. So let's go ahead and replace this whole div section and then we'll talk about what we changed. Okay, so what did I change in here? I made sure that I didn't put to the left but I justified the content between which is going to push the other one out to the right. And if I look at my login partial, it should be ML auto, which is move left auto. Make sure we save all these files and everything should be in there that we need now. So don't just sit there. Let's fire this thing up and see what it looks like. All right, with the application running, you should now see a login button on the right hand side here. So when you hit the login menu, it redirects you to Okta to log in. Once you've entered your password, um, it comes back and says, hello, Lee Brandt. Now I can uh, enter stuff. This one was entered by me, but now I just need to update that form so that the form actually gets the user that's logged in and gives the entered by to the user. Now back in our application, let's go ahead and tell our controller to get the enter by, entered by value from the local user's name. So all we have to do is go back to our create method, remove the entered by from the binding, just like we did with the date time now, and just do favorite band dot entered by equals user dot identity dot name. That's going to get the user's name 
in the entered by value. The other thing we're going to want to do is we're going to go back to the uh, create view. We're going to remove that entered by section. And the only thing they need to put in now is the name of the band that they that they love. Right? So there's only a few more little cleanup things that we need to do. Because right now, people can still edit other people's favorite bands. So we need to put in a little bit more security to make sure that nobody can edit your band but you. Okay, so the last bit of cleanup we're going to do is going to... First of all, make sure that people are logged in. Then we're going to also make sure that they can't edit a favorite band of somebody else. So one of the first things we're going to do, since we're getting the entered by name on the create, let's go ahead and add our authorize attribute. And you may need a using statement. Now we can guarantee that that's going to work. Then in here, we'll do the same thing. Authorize attribute on there. And we're going to pull the entered by and entered on out. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get the existing band, the one that's in the database already. So I'm going to go ahead and get by ID. I'm going to find the one that's saved in the database currently, get it by its ID. <clears throat> then I'm going to check to see if the existing bands entered by is not equal to the user dot identity dot name in other words the person who originally entered it is not the one that's logged in right now then we're just going to return an unauthorized you're not authorized to change this person's Otherwise, what we're going to do is do, uh, we're going to set the existing band's name equal to the one that just came in. Favorite band dot name. And then we're going to save the existing band. We're going to update the existing band. <clears throat> and then just save those changes back to the database. All right. And we'll do the same thing down below with delete. <clears throat> we want to make sure that um, before they can delete one, that they are logged in. And before we delete them, we want to make sure that the band that we have is the one that we're trying to, the one they're trying to delete is actually one that they own. Okay. So we've got uh, context.favorite band. They're going to find that person, that band. Then, <coughs> if that band does not belong to the currently logged in user, if favorite band dot entered by is not equal to the currently logged in user. Then do the same thing, return unauthorized. You can't delete that person's favorite band. No matter how much you might want to, when you find out somebody loves Nickelback and you just really want to delete it, you just shouldn't be able to. Okay, so <clears throat> a couple more things we're going to need to do here. Okay, <clears throat> a couple more things we need to do here. We need to go into the index. And you'll see that on the index, it's got these edit and delete here. We're going to want to surround those in, um, in these if statements. So we moved details up above it and we put in a span around those bars. Um, so if the user is authenticated and the item that we're getting ready to display was entered by the currently logged in user, then show them the edit and delete button. This way, it won't even show them the edit or delete button unless they're actually logged in and they own that favorite band. Then they can do that. And same thing with the details. 
The details just has an edit and a delete in there. Um, just go ahead and wrap. Well, it only has an edit. I added the delete because it would be nice to be able to delete it from there. But if the again, if the user's logged in and they own this record, then they can edit or delete it. Otherwise, they can't. And the last thing that I did do that I should have done earlier is I went through and I removed the uh, entered by and the entered on from this form. When it scaffolded it out, it put those in there and um, we don't need those anymore. And honestly, you wouldn't need them in the entered by and entered on anyway for the edit um, because those things aren't going to change. Those are entered by values. So we don't want to change those. So now we should be able to run this thing and only be able to edit our records and only be able to delete our records. All right, with our application fired up for the last time, we are logged in because I'm still logged into Okta. So um, when I log out, it will actually log me out of Okta. So when I go to log in again, <clears throat> it'll reprompt me for my username and password. Now when I come over here to favorite bands, there is favorite bands in here, but I don't see the edit or delete here because the, it's the favorite of me. It was entered by somebody named me, which that's not who's logged in currently. So if I go to create a new one, here's my band artist name. Um, and we'll say, who's my favorite band this week? Five Finger Death Punch. We'll go ahead and create, create now. Five Finger Death Punch is created is a favorite of Lee Brandt. It's created then and the details edit and delete are there. Hey, thanks for joining me with this uh, pretty long screencast. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure you click the subscribe button down below and hit the little bell so you get notified when new content comes out from Octa Developers. Happy coding!